I'm, I'm very happy to open the next session, our third session, after the uh, very impressive we had before, and even I think the first wasn't that bad. I mean, I'm speaking about myself. Uh, uh, we are now uh, dealing with the question of evil in, in the context of theodicy in one sense and the other, of course, in the discussion on discourse on the Holocaust. And so I'm very happy to in, invite Gabriel Motzkin, Professor Gabi Motzkin. He is the head of this institute and he has written extensively on a lot of subjects. He has a wonderful book on time and transcendence. And he will talk to us about the evil after the Holocaust. This is a draft of a paper that I will be writing together with Avishai Margali. And I give this as first thoughts, and it's in a completely different discourse from anything you've heard before, because there's nothing theological about it. Now, one thing that you have to keep in mind is the distinction that Kant made between evil and radical evil. And radical evil sounds like it's radical. What we mean by radical evil is something very simple. It means the denial of a shared humanity that we set as radical evil. Now, another question which we did not address that came to me, though, in hearing the last session, which is how do you expiate an evil and how do you expiate a radical evil, which is not at all the same kind of a thing, because if you have once denied a shared humanity, uh, is it just enough to go back and say, well, really, I was mistaken? And, you know, and I think that's something that requires further thought. So having said that, I will read my somewhat short paper. Evil after the Holocaust. Has the Holocaust changed our conception of evil? Certainly we attach images to our idea about evil that we did not imagine before. The chimneys at Auschwitz, the masses in the trains, the face of Hitler. But does that mean that we think about evil any differently than we did before 1940? Answering this question means raising the issue of how the Holocaust could affect our conception of evil. If collective murder is more evil than the murder of a large set of individuals, then indeed our conception of evil has changed. Killing a people would be worse than killing the same number of unrelated individuals. But we do not think that. We think of the Holocaust as the murder of six million individuals, and yet we also add the idea that killing these people as Jews somehow added to the offense of killing them. We are not going to take the, this path in this paper, but we think it should be posed at the beginning because we are Jews, and so it can be presumed that we have a special relation to this murder. We feel the genocide of the Jews more than we feel the genocide in Rwanda, even though it is difficult to tell them apart as genocides. Both Rwanda and the Holocaust share much in common, but there is a difference. What do they share in common? Both are consequences of perpetrating evil in a secular context. In a secular context. They are neither group murders carried out on a religious basis, nor does the evil that they exhibit flow from a theological concept of evil. In Rwanda, one group of people decided to kill another so as to be rid of them in their country. The basis for this genocide was ethno-nationalism. The Holocaust was also a consequence of a nationalism gone wrong, but its perpetrators also embraced an evil ideology that seemed to them to justify their actions. And we're going to say a lot more about what that ideology was. Moreover, it has been argued that many of the perpetrators viewed their actions in quasi-religious terms. Murdering the Jews was necessary for the survival of the German race. This evil ideology combined nationalism and Darwinism. Some humans are more fit than others, and therefore those that are fitter should survive. If the Nazis had been consistent, they would have also stated that no genocide would be necessary in the state of nature, since nature would decide whether Jews or Germans are the fitter people. The Nazi critique of civilization was that civilization had derailed the process of natural selection by making it possible for weak people to survive and even to reproduce more than strong people. Again, if they had been consistent, they would have blamed the agricultural revolution for this consequence, for then it, it was then, the agricultural revolution, that people became smaller and less healthy and more numerous all at once. But that is not what the Nazis said. They did not want to get rid of cities and industries and modern technology. 
It was their role to intervene in the process of reproduction and divert it to correct for the distortions that the agricultural and industrial revolutions had introduced into the human development process. That means for the Nazis that they claimed to know what nature would have selected under all conditions and that they could determine that one human being was more developed and evolved than another. Interestingly, the Nazis did not think that intelligence was the mark of development, nor did they imagine that moral development, e.g. ending cannibalism, also had something to do with human development. Their model was a combination of admiration for the big bodies that people develop in cold climates and for the blonde camouflage that enabled humans to survive in the context of a snowy background. The Nazis, however, did not think, in contrast to Darwin, that it is the environment that decides which species and which variety within a species is fitter. Nor did they think that they could affect the process by changing the environment, which was a, what a consistent Darwinist might have concluded. Instead, armed with their idea of their superior humanity, they decided to eliminate other models of humanity as defined by them. They focused their eugenic intention on the Jews. Their victims were primarily the Ashkenazi Jews living in Central and Eastern Europe, although they did not claim to distinguish between different types of Jews. Moreover, the real criteria were religious and not racial, for they spared a group of Jews known as Karaites, who had split off from mainstream Judaism a thousand years ago, and therefore were not considered religiously as Jews, even though a consistently genetic perspective would have characterized the Karaites as Jews. Now, Ashkenazi Jews are known today to have a trait that the Nazis did not know about. On average, this is controversial, but you should hear this, they are one standard deviation, they test one standard deviation more intelligent than any other people. So when the Nazis killed the European Jews, they killed the most intelligent group in the human species. If one believes that intelligence is part of fitness, this population should have been carefully preserved. Most evolutionary biologists attribute human success to human intelligence. Killing the most intelligent people diminishes the, long, the chances for long-range human success. Of course, we do not think the Nazis were evil for this utilitarian reason, but we do believe that Nazi ideology was marked both by its arbitrary choice of a superior race and by its inconsistent choice of an inferior race. Moreover, the Nazis went further. They claimed that the Jews were not a race at all, but rather a genetic disease that needed to be eliminated so that the Aryan human race could flourish. All Jews, whether conscious of what they carry or not, possess inside their seed this bacillus, and they are driven to infect other races and peoples with this germ so as to spread their own genetic disease throughout the entire human race. Because Jews seek out sex with Gentiles in order to infect them, and they can't help themselves and stop their own drive, therefore healthy human beings have to destroy the Jews in order to make sure that future generations will be healthy. We do not know how many Nazis actually believed all of this, but it was more than enough. In any large collective crime of this kind, there are two kinds of people, which we call instigators and compliers. Instigators do not have to execute their crimes, they just have to set the wheels in motion. Compliers range all the ways from people who kill other people because they are told to, to people who support the regime that carries out such actions, to bystanders who do nothing to stop it. As we can see, the problem of judging the evil of compliers is complicated because different behaviors cannot be simply lumped together. On the other hand, instigators are far from events will often say that they had nothing to do with certain actions. This is the famous problem of the Schreibtisch data, the people who just signed written orders. Legal systems that are oriented to punishing people for perpetrating crimes have problems with instigators since legal systems prefer to judge actions rather than ideas. But the really evil people here are the instigators without diminishing the guilt of compliers. In other words, the Holocaust has introduced us, as never before, to the idea of ideological evil, to the idea that a system of values and ideas can be evil all by itself, even if no one acts in it. It is my contention that Nazi ideology was evil even if not a single Jew had been killed as a consequence of it. Attila and Genghis Khan were fully as brutal and as genocidal as Hitler, 
but they had no system of values that dismembered any sense of shared humanity. One of Genghis Khan's drives was to personally impregnate, impregnate as many captive women as possible after having liquidated their families. Nothing could have been further from Nazi ideology. However, this characterization of ideological evil does not exhaust the Holocaust. Ideological evil can happen in different contexts and that does not need actuation to be qualified as evil. In the same way, genocide can, be, can occur without ideology and that does not need an ideology in order to be qualified as evil. What marks the Holocaust is the bizarre fusion of ideology and genocide. The argument has been advanced that there is no difference between this fusion of ideology and genocide and the crimes that Stalin perpetrated against his own people. We see one difference, and it is not a difference in action, but a difference in values. Stalin and the communists believed in the concept of a shared humanity, but that, of course, does not make their actions any better. Indeed, it has argue, been argued, that Martin Melia, that Stalin's crimes were worse precisely because he committed them in the name of a universal humanity. Thereby, he degrades the concept. We do not agree with this argument because we distinguish between an evil ideology and evil actions. We do not believe that you can judge actions according to their ideology, nor ideology according to what happens as a result. Killing people is evil unless it happens in immediate self-defense. And ideology is evil if it questions the common obligations that we should have towards all human beings. The fascination with Nazism is not a consequence of Nazi actions, but rather of Nazi ideology. Stalin was personally evil, but communism is not so much evil as it is absurd. Hitler may be, have been personally evil, but Nazism itself was evil. The opposite of Nazism is the idea that we belong to one humankind, and therefore we need minimally to take care of each other. It is possibly this idea that is the beginning of civilization. Until a certain point in time, most of our ancestors were cannibals and viewed strangers as potential food. The idea that we have obligations to strangers only seeped through slowly. But it could be argued that it is the reverse side of the coin to living in organized societies and states. An organized society cannot view all strangers as not human. The Greeks, the ancient ones, did think that the barbarians were only questionably human, but they did extend their concept of humanity to the other civilized peoples, notably the Egyptians and the Persians. Today, this belief in a universal shared humanity is a thin belief. Most people do not act on it most of the time, but that is also because it is so obvious that it seems unimaginable to most people that someone could not believe it. Thus, when we judge another system of values, such as communism, we assume some shared values and then criticize communism for how it distorts these values. It could be argued that most people took a long time to understand the radical difference contained in Nazism because its radical shift in basic axioms could not occur to most people, not even to many Germans, no matter how often it was stated explicitly. People really believed that the Nazis did not really mean what they said because they often could not take it seriously. They had no such problem with communism. Ernst Nolte has notoriously argued that Nazism can only be understood in the context of anti-communism. It is true that any non-communist movement of the post-World War I period needs to be understood in terms of its response to communism. But it is not true that any such non-communist response is morally relativized by the alleged moral evil of communism. There were two kinds of possible response to communism. Since communism claimed that it was the movement with the highest degree of universality, one could either claim that one's preferred movement was even more universal, or one could claim that particularity should triumph universality. Most responses were of the second kind, for which specific nationalism was to be preferred to a universal working class. The question that then arose was the one of how my particularism should treat your particularism. On the one hand, post-World War I national minority movements preached a universal tolerance of all differences. We know this from postmodernism. On the other hand, the Nazis believed that all other particularisms, except their own, were bad ones. That means that the Nazis believed that they were a particular self confronting a universal other. This universal other was not 
just communism, but any other collective grouping at all. This imputation of universalism to all enemies could be characterized as a negative universalism. If one believes that a positive universalism, such as the belief in a shared humanity, is the highest good, then a negative universalism, which believes that all others are inferior, embodies the lowest evil. The clear consequence of anti-Nazism must be a denial of the inferiority of others. One cultural factor favorable to decolonization after the defeat of the Nazis was the post-war rejection of the idea that some groups are congenitally, that means from birth, inferior to others, which was a widely held worldview before World War II. You didn't have to be a Nazi to believe in the inferiority of other people, racial inferiority of other people. And this view, as you know, is something that is not tenable after the Second World War. However, our current belief system is not all that coherent. On the one hand, we believe in a shared humanity. On the other hand, we all have particular identifications with family, clan, religion, and country that we at different times hold more intensely. The belief system of liberalism seeks to bridge this divide by formulating a minimal universalism and seeking to convince us at the same time not to take our particular identifications too seriously. Here the question is whether one can have a liberal worldview that is coherent, since liberalism seeks to bridge such heterogeneous effective needs. Liberalism is at a disadvantage in confronting totalitarian ideologies because it has to argue that the response to such challenges has to take place on different levels. The relation between these different levels is then an issue for a liberal worldview, e.g., when does my nationalism trump my universalism and vice versa? Those adhering to a liberal worldview have an unstable notion of the otherness of others. In the post-war world, this question of how we deal with otherness has become a central cultural concern. We believe that we should recognize the equality of others, but we have, do not have good ways for dealing with the incommensurability of others, i.e. there is sometimes no good measure that can compare between our beliefs and theirs. We entertain a positive notion of otherness, but as a consequence, we cannot espouse a radical concept of otherness because our judgment of otherness only makes sense in the context of our belief in a shared humanity. But we cannot give up on our positive evaluation of otherness because it would lead us back to giving grace to different varieties of otherness, i.e. some kind of otherness is better than some other kind of otherness. Clearly, our post-war liberal ideology is a response to an ideology that rejected both positive universalism and the positive evaluation of specific and particular otherness. Why is this important? It matters because ideology lasts. Violence is evil because it seeks to decide an issue on the spot by killing the other. The assumption of such violence is that once there is, the other is dead, there is no need for future violence. One argument against the Nazis has been the curious one that they would have gone on killing other people, on to killing other people after finishing with the Jews. For that argument, the assumption that violence is terminal poses a contradiction, since continued killing implies either that violence is not terminal or that there are a lot of people who have to be terminated. However, whatever one's position on this, on this, ideology is essentially different because an ideology always proposes a permanent solution for the problems it addresses. The comparison between ideology and violence may show why it is so shocking when ideology is combined with violence, the alleged perman permanence of ideology and the suddenness of violence. After the Holocaust, many people sought to show how the actions of the Nazis were more evil than those of others. Our claim is that what was more evil about the Nazis was their ideology. And this ideology has, like all ideologies, only been temporarily defeated since ideologies last. Once they have been formulated, they are wired into our imagination and are not so easily expunged. When we are threatened by such a violent ideology, we adopt aversive measures, such as the postmodern idea of privileging the otherness of others. What then does the near triumph of Nazism tell us? First, we can privilege no set of human beings over another. Second, the evil on which they capitalize, the human hatred of others, is endemic to the human condition. The Nazis provided an ideology that justified this hatred of others and demonstrated once and for all how a system of values can be inherently evil. Thank you.
Yeah, you're invited for questioning. Please. You need to talk to the mic so that we can record you forever. You have to turn it on. There's a button you push and you see the light. Um, yeah, on mute. So it's, it sounded like you wanted to divorce action from ideology in the paper, but that seems a little difficult from where I'm sitting, is that in some ways the, what, what makes Nazi ideology the most evil is that it, that it assumes one type of humanity is better than the other. But the same argument could be made against Jewish chosenness, and therefore what has to separate those would be the actions, I would assume. No, I disagree. I no? think you're taking it into the wrong place. I wouldn't get into our, our Jewish theology. Jewish chosenness may be a bad idea, but Jewish chosenness never assumes actually eliminating other people. Whereas Nazi ideology, I said the distinction I draw in Nazi ideology and their actions is they have an ideology of wanting to kill other people. Now whether actually, now Hitler could have had that crackpot ideology in Vienna and never gotten to a single person to vote for him, and then we would have forgotten about it. And my claim that as an ideology, it's evil even without any action. Now Jewish chosenness is a whole other debate, and I'm not going to get it into it now on whether I think it's bad or good. I generally tend to think it's bad, but that's a different story, and I don't think it has anything to do with this particular issue, but for different reasons. Because remember my initial remark, which is that one has to distinguish between what is radically evil and what is evil. And radically evil means an evil that I think in some ways is inexorable. There's no way you can liberalize nationalism. Like, you know, there were the Euro-communists Euro who tried to make, or the socialists who tried to make Marxism into a good or moderate idea. I don't think there is such a thing as a moderate or liberal or forward-looking Nazism that you can somehow get out of it and de dilute it down to a more democratic doctrine or to a more moral doctrine or to a more theological doctrine. I don't think these things are, are available. And because they're not available, why? Because the it's inherence of the ideology is the elimination of other people. And it's not now the question of whether it's Jews that need to be eliminated or Poles or gypsies or all the other people they had, homosexuals, all the other people they had on their long laundry list. You know, if the point was that the ideology itself envisioned the eugenic elimination of large numbers of other people and in this way denied the notion of a shared humanity. Nothing in Judaism denies the, sh the shared humanity of other people. But the emphasis then... What? I don't know what you're talking about. But, but, uh, that, I can't speak Hebrew to me because I don't understand. My point. It. But the point is that, again, consequences, the consequences of ideology become central again. No, I, that's what I've reached the conclusion that they don't. Because if you judge, the, you'll never get out of that. Because you see, the point is this. Genghis Khan probably killed proportionately many more people than Hitler or Stalin. And he certainly eliminated whole groups of people, as Michal Biran at the university. And yet, no matter how much we are horrified by Genghis Khan, we don't view him the same way. Why not? It's the combination of ideology and action. And that's what I said. So killing six million people is not killing for the reasons the Nazis gave for killing their people. I don't mean to say it's good. I think it's pretty awful to kill all those people. But I mean to say that we have to distinguish that because of that between, between radical evil and evil. That's, that's the point, I think. Yeah, Michael Feigenblatt, please. Yes. <laughs> Woodcuts, Professor Woodcuts. Well, um, it was very interesting in terms of what contradicts what. Uh, but, uh, please take the microphone. Light it. But it seems to me, uh, I mean, you mentioned Nolte. It's on. You mentioned Nolte, but there were all these other historians, including Habermas, you know, who wanted to take it out of history, if you remember. And I was in Berlin at the time of the debate among the historians. Now, I have the feeling that this whole notion of, of looking at you from a distance and looking at Nazism, as though it existed at a given moment, or as, as though it existed as, a, as a, an ideology, a full-fledged ideology from the start, we know it was not the case historically, at least, and that it only developed in due time, and all the killing and all the extermination came only l later in the game, and, and was 
rationalized very differently than the way you present it. But I also, it brought to mind, uh, do you know Jeffrey Alexander's? Yes, of course. Uh, you know it. And the whole uh, idea of the Holocaust, that now look at it as the ultimate, ultimate. That's what I'm talking about. I, I know, I know. But that it is a development which we ourselves, in description of what took place, constructed. Because we ourselves needed that, and the debate now whether each genocide is also a holocaust is, is of course... Ruth I, said, Ruth, I said that at the beginning of my talk. I said, has the holocaust changed our conception of evil? It's not really about the holocaust, and it's not about history, and I don't really care for this talk about what really happened. I only cared about the way we think about things. And I'm saying the way we think about things has changed completely. And it's changed completely because we have constructed certain models which we always do to think about the past. Uh, you know, the donation of Constantine was a forgery, and yet for a thousand years it affected Europe very directly. Now, the Holocaust wasn't a forgery, but it's clearly that the history of an event and its reception in, by posterity are not to be confused with each other, and you cannot use history to debunk reception, because reception is a historical fact all by itself. And because it's all by itself uh, a fact, so that, that you have to accept that we have constructed the Holocaust as our other, as our rejected other. And because it's our rejected other, we, have to we can either say one of two things. We can either say, no, in fact, we want to go back and prove that the Holocaust was something quite different, and then we reach a very big risk, or we can say, no, we justify our construction of absolute evil, but then we have to find the reasons for doing so. So it's one of those two. No, you, but you attribute it to the Nazis themselves, no. some of the thinking that you later on attribute to them. In other words, what I'm trying to say, uh, what happened uh, in Germany and all the contradictions and so on, I mean, uh, are uh, related to conditions at the time and how it developed. Now that, that you reconstruct it and look at it as, as something which you try to define and find contradictions in, it's, uh, it's okay. I agree with you that reception is another stage in history. I want to say, I, I want to, I, I'll reply to you. I think that the, the uh, this is an argument I've been having with Michael Head for the last 30 years. I don't believe, I don't believe, I don't much believe in historical context. And I don't much believe in historical context for very simple reasons that I think that extraordinary movements and that human life is generally about decontextualizing yourself. And the great thinkers or anybody else, is, the context is always dialectical to the movement, so it doesn't reflect it. They're trying to fight their context. And that most people, most of the time, are trying to get out of wherever they are. And because of that, I think that Nazism also had a tremendous story about the German 19th century, about German bourgeois life, and all the rest. And they were interested in rejecting the Bildungsbürgertum and everything else. And they said all that. Therefore, now, the other thing is about the Nazis and Darwinism. Nazis were deeply influenced by Darwinism. Naturally, they weren't as consistent or as systematic as I make out. I agree with you. But one of the great things to do is to try to trace back Nazi ideas of race and to go through hundreds of turgid books written in the early 20th century and to see they had no coherent idea of race. But that doesn't help us out, because were they racist? Yes. Did they construct concepts of race? Yes. Did they kill people according to those concepts of race? Yes. So the fact that their concepts were incoherent, self-contradictory, uh, you know, that they determined themselves a la Lueger, who is Jewish and who isn't, all is true. But the inconsistency argument, which is the historical argument every time, doesn't really work. Now we, when we view things retrospectively, we always simplify. So we're not, you know, so we, if you ask yourself how much you think about Augustus, you have maybe two tags about Augustus in your mind, and that's it, unless you're a Roman historian of that period. And you can't have any more because there's just too much out there. Now, in the same way, what I'm saying is that we have a moral economy which has been determined by our determination of what we view the Holocaust to be. And that, uh, the question was, has it changed our conception of evil? That's the one question I wanted to raise. Has it changed our conception of evil, and if so, how? And I think and you may disagree, but I think the answer is yes, though after hearing some of the talks today, I'm perhaps a little less sure. But you see, but I think, though, that there is, there is a distinction with our images of evil, that I think clearly we have images of evil that have existed at no other time in human history, that we all carry around in our minds, because we've seen the exhibitions and seen the films and everything else. So, and those, and if, if, if I ask the non-Jews among you, 
Wait, wait, what's your idea of the most evil thing that's happened? I bet half the non-Jews would reply, uh, the, uh, the Holocaust, unless they say the killing of Christ. You know, but that's a minority in the modern world. And the majority would say the Holocaust. It's just really obvious. And that, I think, it, it changed. You know, it's a... Okay. I think, I think we should, I mean, we, you go on up. discussing. We have another two questions, please. It was Merav, yeah. yeah well, um, Dr. Merav Mark. I didn't say the algae was dead. No, but if, you know, people, I, I mean, the, the whole excitement about ideology that was in the past is going down, I think. Um, but what, what the real this point is, what I thought that when, when I looked at the title, I thought the thesis would be that um, the Holocaust was turning point, and from now on, we'll only see a repetition of this. This kind of evil cannot, you know, it's not unique. It would be, it was unique, but once it happened once, I, I want to make it very clear. Ideologies are human possibilities, just like inventions are, just like uh, saviors are, like anything else. Human possibilities do not disappear. They do not disappear. You know, uh, I'll, I'll put it in another way. We all have the possibility of being cannibals because it's part of our historical experience that some human beings sometimes were cannibals. It doesn't mean we're going to go out and eat other people, but we know that under certain circumstances, some of us will. And you see, and the point is this, it's this possibility, and I'm taking that deliberately as an extreme possibility. And what I'm saying is that the Nazi ideology, this is something Abba Kovner understood in 1945 when he said, you know, we have to be prepared for the next time they attack us. And the reason this fantasy exists is not because ideologies are out of fashion or not. They are, as human possibilities, they are always there, like incest. We have a ban on incest. We're sure incest goes on all the time. Why are we sure we know the statistics? Why is that? Because once incest happens, it can happen again and again and again. The worst thing about a crime of any kind is precisely this capacity for its repetition. That doesn't mean it will. But once it's there, it changes our conception of what is evil because we, just like in a law court, have to address a new situation. William. Uh, I, I'm trying to talk low. No, they'll give you the mic in a second. Uh, <clears throat> it's, um, and that, that was, I found very, very interesting paper. The focus on ideology, that, that interested me there. Uh, you were implying that there's something about Nazi ideology that is irreformable in the direction of a moderate Nazism or a more liberal, kinder, gentler version of Nazism. But I, I was thinking, uh, Christoph and I had a conversation yesterday about uh, Solovyev's Antichrist, the tale of the Antichrist. And here you, has a, you have a tale of an ideology which is, morally speaking, at the absolutely highest level. So it's, it's in one sense, on, to all appearances, exactly the opposite to the Nazi ideology. It has all of the good things of the modern, liberal, enlightenment and uh, so on and so on but from the standpoint of the story of the antichrist it's uh, it's it's false and hollow it has it, it presents the if you like the counterfeit double of a true moral ideology but there's something fundamentally wrong about the whole thing no I, i'm only putting that as a kind of a, a counterpart to the notion that you could have good ideologies precisely in presenting goodness in a certain way mask the fact that there is a kind of hollowness at the core. And I'm just wondering what you think about a thought like that in relation to... I th I'll tell you what I think, and it's a quick off-the-cuff, because I think you pose a deep problem which I, haven't, which I didn't deal with. And I think that the issue there is a different issue because it is the issue of fakery. In other words, it's the issue where you are pretending to be something and you really aren't. So you're pretending to be a good person or have a good ideology, but at your core, you aren't. Now, I was presenting a much simpler case where people are declaredly evil and where the question of pretense, now you see the question would be also, could you pretend to be evil without being evil, on the other hand? See, does that really work? Oh, I just did this in my spare time. 
you know, or something like that. It's, I'm, not, I'm really an authentic human lover, but I just killed Jews or killed blacks or whatever it is, just because this was something that was a pastime. I had to do it. Now, you see that the point there is that the argument of inauthenticity in pursuing the good gets turned around when we talk about the evil. Because then you, say, you, you vaunt, after you're caught, your inauthenticity, because you didn't really believe what you were doing as the sign of your salvation. So, uh, and that problem is a very deep problem, which is the question of, uh, of intent. In other words, what does it mean to be an authentically good person, even in Heideggerian terms? You know, authenticity is three moments in your life, maybe, if you're lucky. And the reason, and the reason it is that is because, in the other hand, you can never know on those standards whether you are reflecting, like whether you're a Calvinist who's saved, how are you going to know? And in the same way, how are you as an authentic person ever going to know that the core of your belief is not empty? In other words, in that sense, there is some sense in which we're all inauthentic. I, I was moving at a much smaller level because I was just trying to say, let us take as a definition that our core thin belief is the belief in a shared humanity. You know, something very thin, very easy, very watery, doesn't require too much, and then see who says no. And then says, who says no and why? And then once you do that, then you, I think, and that's extending it as widely as possible. Now, I think the problem you pose of resemblance, and uh, of resemblance is, is, is a problem that requires a lot of further thought. Okay. Thank you very much, Gabi. And we are now having Amit Kravitz who's actually a student of mine, and he will talk to us uh, on something that's related to his PhD. He is finishing by right now, if I understand correctly, and he, uh, he, this, he's talking about, he will talk about the impossibility of being devilish on the asymmetry between good and evil in Kant's ethical thought. So, here, take my microphone. Okay. Well, Professor Motzkin spoke about the difference between radical evil and evil. In Kant, it's the difference between radical evil and teuflisch, devilish evil. So it will be a different difference, but I will, I will say about something. Okay, the fact that the concept of good and evil are not defined as, as two dist uh, strict oppositions, uh, opposites, has of course roots in the philosophical tradition Kant knew well. For Aristotle, for example, and without getting into details, vice is not exactly the opposite of virtue. Uh, for instance, assuming that being brave is a virtue, it has two opposites, and not just one. Being cowardly, that is having too much fear, or being rash and foolish, that is having too little fear or too much confidence. There is always a pair of vices corresponding one virtue. Now Kant grasped ethics in an entirely different way, of course, and I will focus here on three problems rega uh, regarding the asymmetry between the concept of moral evil and moral good, all ascribed, of course, and this is the presumption, to action taken by free agent. The existence of evil, this will be the first point, the definition of evil versus the definition of good, and the freedom to choose evil versus the freedom to choose good. Okay? Now, Kant is facing a unique problem when he tries to illuminate the concept of moral evil. Surprising as it may sound, Kant did not discuss systematically the concept of moral evil in his many writings about ethics. And the concept of moral evil does not even belong to the Kantian moral theory as such. The systematic discussion of the concept of evil appears only in Kant's theory of religion. Now, it is not true that he didn't discuss evil at all, but he did not discuss it systematically. It was not a systematic part of ethics, and I will explain why. Now, this fact is not accidental. The source of validity of the categorical imperative, that is what one ought to do, is independent of experience as such. Put differently, the empirical fact that people actually act in an immoral way, including in an evil way, does not belong to the terrain of moral theory as Kant saw it, since moral theory deals with what ought to be, that is, with imperatives, and not with the factual state of human, being, of human beings, evil as it may be. In grounding for the metaphysics of moral, Kant writes, and I quote, even if there never have been actions springing from, from respect for the moral law, the question is at issue here is not whether this or that 
has happened, but that reason of itself and independently of all experience command, uh, commands what ought to be happened, end quote. And Kant gives an example, for instance, I quote again, even though there might never yet have been a sincere friend, still pure sincerity in friendship is nevertheless required, end quote. According to this passage and many others, there is a clear, uh, it is clear that at, to some extent at least, pure moral theory has nothing to do with the way uh, human beings are, even if they are morally evil, but only with the way they ought to be. But there is more to it. Kant gives explicit criteria which should help us evaluate whether a free agent is to be considered moral or not. That is, whether he acted out of morality and not just in accordance with morality. I will say something about it later. Without getting into details because it's, it's a heavy subject, okay, accepting the respect for the moral law as the incentive, trifeder, of the action, that is, when the respect for the moral law determines directly the will, then the agent is to be considered as one who acted morally. In other words, Kant gives uh, several formulations of, uh, of this criteria, when the mere representation of the moral law serves as the sufficient incentive of the will, the free agent is considered moral. However, even though Kant gives, as I mentioned, explicit criteria which serve as a, which serve as a means to determine whether a free agent is to be considered moral or not, he nevertheless insists that we can never tell whether an action, even our own action, corresponded to this criteria or not. That is, what was our, so to say, true incentive that uh, guided our action. I quote again, now a small sentence from, a little uh, short sentence from Critic of Pure Reason, the real morality of actions, their merit or guilt, even that uh, of our own conduct, thus remains entirely hidden from us. The eigentliche Moralität der Handlungen bleibt daher gänzlich verborgen. verborgen. We can never tell. This uncertainty, so to say, of the true incentive that guided our will is a fact that has nothing to do with the validity of our duties. Even if the danger of self-deception, as I call it, regarding what really causes my own will always remains, even if I cannot tell if I'm a moral agent or an evil agent, it still does not change the status of those duties. What I ought to do is being determined a priori, and its source of validity is independent of the way people actually behave. And it stays valid even if one can never tell what was his true incentive, so to say, and even if not a single person has ever acted in a moral way. Okay? Even if Jesus had not existed, can said explicitly, we would still have our duties. Does this mean that the actual state of human beings does not, uh, does not interest Kant at all? Well, not exactly. The factual state of human beings is relevant to Kant in two respects, but, but both have nothing to do with the problem of evil. Let me explain. First, the presumption that people actually do not behave in a moral way is a necessary condition for ethics. Ethics cannot order the agent to do what he ought to do if that agent was not in an immoral situation in the first place. But being in a non-moral situation is not identical with being morally evil. Not acting morally and being morally evil are two different things. Two, Kant must assume that an actual uh, agent, flesh and blood agent, so to say, can indeed become a moral agent, that is, he can make the moral law into the sufficient incentive of his will, since ought to implies can, as Kant famously argued. The actual situation is relevant to Kant only to the extent that it is possible for the free agent to change his moral state. Once again, moral evil has nothing to do with this possibility as such. It does not matter exactly in which state the moral agent is or was. Okay? All that matters is the possibility of acting differently. So without the fact that people do not behave morally, there was no point in telling, them, in telling them what they ought to do. And there was no point in telling them what they ought to do if what they ought to do was not possible for them. But in both cases, it has nothing to do with moral evil as such, but only with not, non, not acting morally. Laziness can account for not acting morally as well, but moral evil is a more specific problem. 
I will quickly summarize the, the whole discussion here about the existence. Kant's moral theory does not include a description of the way people actually behave, but a description of the way people ought to behave and can behave. That is their duty. Therefore, ethics uses the model category of possibility, not of actuality. From a moral point of view, the question why the respect for the moral law does not determine the will, why am I not moral, even though it ought to, is not a principal question. All that matters is that it can. Kant's moral theory gives us only the grammar of moral action. That is a criterion of evaluation of actions and moral agents. And it remains valid, as I, say, as I said, even when no one ever acted as required and even if no one will ever act in this way. What about evil, then? Concerning morality, as I pointed out, the fact that no one acted morally does not change the concept of duty. But it is not the same with evil. Without assuming that a, mor that, that a moral evil agent does exist or existed, the discussion about evil which will turn out to be an empty game of possibilities, just like discussing the categories in Kant's epistemology without the receptive part of cognition. This is why Kant writes in Religion Within the Limits of Reason Alone, and I quote again, in order to call a man evil, it would have to be possible a priori to infer, and now this is very important, from several evil acts done with conscience of their evil, or from one such act, an underlying evil maxim. Here, and this point is very crucial, we start from an actual situation, from an actual action, and not from a possible action. And then we must explain, with the help of some a priori principles, its possibility. When, when Kant ascribes his moral theory an a priori status, he means that its claim for validity does not rest upon experience, upon the way people actually behave. But when Kant uses the term a priori when discussing his theory of evil, of moral evil, it has a different sense. If and only if there is or was a moral evil agent, then we cannot explain its possibility without assuming some a priori principles that determined his action. I will say something about this a priori principle soon. But, the, but this difference is crucial. Existing is, so to say, the starting point of the discussion about evil. There is evil. Uh, and, this, and, the, in, and existence is the last point, so to say, of the discussion in ethics. Here we try to give an a priori explanation of something that already happened or happens. And there we, ascribe what, uh, there we describe what ought to happen, even if it did not happen at all. Now Kant cannot prove the fact that there is a moral even agent, just as, he cannot prove, just as he cannot prove the fact that there is a moral agent. Since, as I mentioned earlier, we can never tell what, was the, what the true incentive guiding our action was. So Kant's starting point in his discussion of moral evil starts with an assumption that he cannot prove. Moral evil does exist. An assumption that he does not need in his discussion about ethics. Okay, so this was the first point, the asymmetry between the existence of evil and the existence of good. Now I'm moving forward to the second problem, the definition of moral evil. Now, assuming that moral evil exists, how does Kant define it? And how does his definition of moral evil illuminate the difference between the status of good and evil? The most important distinction here is between two, concept that Kant is, two concepts that Kant is using, predisposition to good, Anlage zum Guten, and propensity to evil, Hang zum Bösen. Let me start with the concept of predisposition. Predisposition towards the good, as he, as he calls it. Kant distinguishes three sorts of predisposition to the good. The predisposition to animality, that is, to mechanical self-love. The predisposition to humanity, that is, we judge ourselves happy or unhappy only in comparison with others. And the third one, it's the most important one here, the predisposition to personality, personalität, which Kant defines as, and I quote again, the capacity for the respect for the moral law as in, as in itself a sufficient incentive of the will. Okay? But, was, but what is Kant referring to when he says original predisposition? What does he mean with original? This is very important here. Kant mentions that predispositions and I quote again, are original for they are, for they are bound up with the possibility of human nature. Okay? That is, the, this, uh, the predispositions 
are elements of the formal definition of human beings as such, no matter what their moral character is. This is something that is shared by, by everyone. In light of this, all three predispositions have the same logical status, so to say, since all three are necessary conditions of the very definition of human agent as such. But there is an inner difference between the first and the, and the last one, between the, two, the first two and the last one, between self-love on the one hand and the capacity to make the respect for the moral law a sufficient incentive of the will on the other hand. Kant writes, I quote again, from religion within the, within the limits of reason and law, we can indeed use the first two contrary to their ends, but can extirpate, can't use the fertilgen, to annihilate maybe, none of them. Hmm? Out. 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 Yeah. Extirpate was the English translation that I've read. Okay. This remark is highly important since, since it points out that the last predisposition, the respect for the moral law, has a unique status. Let me explain. It is clear, I assume, why the mechanical self-love can be used contrary to its end. <clears throat> Even though Kant treats his predisposition, this predisposition as a predisposition to good, self-love can make someone act like a beast, as Kant mentions. But regarding the respect for the moral law as, sufficient, uh, as a sufficient incentive of the will, we cannot use it contrary to its end. Zbeck Widrich can't use this uh, concept. We can ignore it, we can ignore the moral law, we can choose a different incentive that, uh, that will guide our will, but using the respect for the moral law itself, contra to its end, it's impossible. Okay? This is something that according to Kant, even an evil agent cannot do. I will explain this shortly. Now what is exactly propensity to evil, hang zum bösen? Propensity, and I quote, can be regard regarded as having been acquired als erworben, or brought by man upon himself. What, Cass what Kant wishes to stress here is that the propensity to evil is not to be considered a predisposition, that is, as something that characterizes every agent, no matter what, but rather as something man brought upon himself. Predispositions are, so to say, a fact of human existence, and as such have nothing to do with being good or evil, as it is the only form as it is only the formal definition of a human agent. The question is, of course, from a moral point of view, what the agent actually does with those predispositions. There are three kinds of uh, propensities to evil as well. Frailty of human nature, impurity of human heart, but let me focus here only on the third one, which corresponds to the respect for the moral law. Uh, uh, Kant calls the last propensity to evil the perversity of human heart, Verkehrheit des menschlichen Herzens, for it reverses, umkehrt, the ethical order among the incentive of a free will. What does this mean? A moral agent is an agent that made the moral law his sufficient incentive, an agent that the mere representation of the moral law make, makes him act, and an evil agent well, here, I think, lies the crux of, of the matter. The evil agent has exactly the same predispositions like the moral agent. That is, the respect for the moral law is part of his predispositions as well. This is the second point of asymmetry. Whereas a moral agent makes the representation of the moral law to be a sufficient incentive of his will, the evil agent cannot do it. He cannot act according to a mere representation of a different law, because a different law simply does not exist. There can be no alternative practical philosophy, according to Kant, one in which, say, lying or not giving back a loan would be justified as a categorical imperative. This is why Kant writes that the ground of evil cannot, and I quote again, cannot be placed in, the, in a corruption of moral reason, as if reason could destroy the authority of the very law which is its own, or to deny the obligation arising therefrom. It is absolutely impossible. An evil agent, I would put it differently, has no alternative moral law. There is no, in, there is no evil law. This is precisely the point where Kant stresses that a human being can do radical even, but cannot, do, but cannot be devilish, teuflish. And I quote again, an evil reason comprises too much, for thereby the opposition to the law itself would be set up as, as an incentive and thus the subject would be made a devilish being, which is impossible. Men, even the most wicked, 
does not, under any maxim whatsoever, repudiate the moral law. The law, rather, forces itself upon him irresistibly by, by virtue of his moral predisposition. What is the difference between good and evil, then? The difference between them lies, therefore, therefore in the subordination of the same content. That is, which one of the incentive, self-love, or the respect for the moral law, is the condition for the other? An evil man adopts, indeed, the moral law with the law of self-love, just like a moral agent, yet he subordinates the moral law to the self-love, and not the other way around. That is, self-love becomes the condition of the moral law, and not in reverse, as it should be. An evil agent can do according to, all an evil agent can do according to Kant is to use the same predispositions he shares with the moral agent and to arrange them in a different false order. Put differently, an evil agent can act contrary to the law, but not according to a contradictory law, because there is no contradictory law, which is impossible. Once again, it is clear that evil and good can be defined symmetrically. And now I'm moving forward to the last point about freedom. Freedom to choose the good against freedom to choose evil. Uh, at first glance, it appears that freedom to choose good and freedom to choose evil are symmetrical. Self-love, just like the respect for the moral law, are both original predispositions. From a logical point of view, there is no difference between those two. In this respect, being good or evil is a matter of freedom. The free agent, the free agent can freely choose whether he wants to subordinate self-love to the moral law or the other way around. These two possibilities are always, present, are always present to him equally. If it were not the case, the agent would not be considered a free agent, and his decision would not be a contingent one, but a necessary one, stemming from nature rather than from freedom. But this logical point of view can be a bit misleading, as it implies that freedom to choose good is symmetrical to freedom to choose evil. But this is valid only when viewed on a formal logical level, as I said, and not on an historical level. Let me explain what I mean with historical level. Despite the fact that from a logical point of view, all the predisposition have the same status, it is nevertheless not a completely adequate description. The self-love and the respect for the moral law are indeed original predispositions. But in fact, in reality, and this in fact is very important, the self-love is already active predisposition. It's an active predisposition, whereas the respect for the moral law is only a possible one. Therefore, it is easier to become evil than to become morally good. An evil agent confirms an element that is already active in him, while the moral agent must make an element that was not active at all, but was only a mere possibility, the respect for the moral law, to his sufficient incentive. True, evil being... A being evil requires an effort as well. Kant calls it a positive evil. It requires effort. Since not making the respect for the moral law, the cause of the action is a necessary but not sufficient condition for moral evil. One is to confirm actively the self-love as a sufficient incentive of the will. But the effort here is different. Freedom to choose good is, so to say, more difficult than freedom to choose evil, since it requires two things. A, overcoming an already active element instead of confirming it, and B, taking a non-active element, the respect for the moral law, to become the sufficient incentive of the will. Moral good and moral evil both require freedom as a, pre as a pre presupposition. And principally, freedom, according to Kant, means that one can free himself from the former chain of causes. But the moral agent frees himself from the chain. The evil agent confirms this chain. Both acts are to be considered free, but it is not exactly the same freedom. Okay, so I will summarize now the three main points quickly. The problem of existence. Whereas the question of the existence of a moral agent is of no importance to Kant's ethical theory, since ethic, ethics deals with duties, it is an indispensable starting point uh, for, the theory of, uh, for the theory of evil. This does not mean that experience gives the formal definition of radical evil. It, it does not give it its validity, I mean. But it only means 
but it only means that without the, assu the assumption of an evil agent, all the discussions would be empty. Both discussions concerning good and concerning evil describing contingent, contingent situation, but a discussion about the good describe a situation that ought to be, whereas the discussion about evil describe an actual situation and tries to describe what its necessary a priori conditions are, the subordination, the reversal of the subordination. E two, evil and good are formally, are formally defined differently due to the fact that they both admit the validity of the moral law. Therefore, the moral agent makes the moral law his sufficient incentive of the will, while the evil agent has no alternative for the moral law. All he can do is to reverse the order of the same elements. He can act contrary to the law, but not according to a contradictory law, as I said. And three, freedom to choose the good is not defined as freedom to choose evil. It is more difficult to affirm a non-active element and make it as the sufficient incentive of the will. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much to Amit, and when like we you. open the discussion, yeah. Question of Shem. Uh, Amit, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Uh, I have a, well, it's kind of a comment or, um, I think the, it's not, the, there is, there is a, it's radical evil from one side and uh, self-love on the other side are not in, at the same level at Kant uh, uh, philosophy. They are in di completely different level. They explain something differently. And I think that it's very interesting to see that when it comes, and I, I also commented uh, on uh, Desmond, uh, Mr. Desmond, uh, after his presentation, that we must see that when Kant uh, is uh, starting to speak about radical evil, his way of looking at the thing is completely different because he can't uh, explain a radical evil in the terms of rationality. This is something that he cannot do. What do you mean with terms of rationality? In, in terms of, let's say, the categorical uh, imperative in all its versions. Yeah, because there is no, there is no alternative categorical imperative. So. Sorry? But what does it mean? That it's not it rational? means that there, there, there are two different, uh, completely two different uh, levels, and I think is all, is, uh, the whole issue of evil in Kant's thought is, is, is in a different level, and it's very, he can't uh, make it coherent with his all, uh, whole progress. And I think the way he, 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 he wants us, as people, to be morally good is to illuminate evil by stop, uh, uh, by, by, by getting out of these chains, chain you spoke about, mm -hmm. and start to think only by, by terms of rationality. Well, uh, formally speaking, Kant gives two different definitions of freedom. This is right. When he's, in his ethical project, freedom is defined in one line with being morally, acting according to the moral law, out of morality. Here he speaks about freedom uh, only as a spontaneous act. So it's two different definitions. But I'm not sure that the radical evil agent is not rational. I think he is rational because he's aware of the moral, of the categorical imperative. Okay. And this is, this is the, the, the most profound point w which I wanted to arrive. By, by saying rationality, I think Kant means more than a formal structure. Mm -hmm. Because one of the versions of the imperative category is about shared humanity, as uh, Motkin uh, uh, mentioned before. The it's not on. It as well, yeah, the like, like you have to. You have, yeah. In that sense, I think his way of putting the things is to make an ethics of oaths in the sense that bringing the, the, the sense of good into rationality and avoiding the whole, the whole conversation about evil inside the structure of his uh, moral philosophy. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. This is true. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, clear presentation about Kant. But I, I'm just wondering if you were uh, emphasizing the Grundlegung a bit. 
strongly in relation to the possibility of morality as such. I think you're undoubtedly correct that he's trying to there establish the principle, the supreme principle of morality as a possibility without necessarily making, so to say, existential claims about a good man or whatever. But um, that's in the Grundlegung, but his ethical enterprise as a whole isn't exhausted, of course, by the Grundlegung. So the, the separating possibility and actuality when you take his work as a whole isn't so easily done. Do you refer to the concept of the highest good? Instance, well, you have the notion of the highest good at the end of the critique of practical reason, where again, the tension, the antinomy of pure practical reason, mm -hmm. the tension between autonomy, or not between virtue and happiness, which leads to the famous postulates and so on. Mm -hmm. That's an effort to bring two sides of the more total perspective into some accord with each other. But the thing about the uh, radical evil is that you have the inversion of the moral incentive. And, I mean, I, I, I don't really know how it, in fact, happens. There seems to be a kind of happening in that inversion that somehow becomes simply part of the, the corruption of the moral incentive itself takes hold. But Kant is pointing to this as a happening, but how that inversion between, you know, respect for the pure moral law and the incentive of self-love gets uh, inverted in terms of their priority in the moral agent, it seems to me that this is not at all evident in Kant's... I mean, he says that, but how it in fact uh, takes place is, is very, very difficult. And yet at the same time, he seems to want to attribute it to our own responsibility. We are responsible in this. But, I mean, that seems to me to be a huge element of Kant's account of evil. He wants to put the whole blame on human responsibility itself. Um, and even when he contemplates the possibility of a, a divine supplement that would get us out of our bind, I think he's not really interested in that at all. Gabby brought up the question of uh, uh, you know, uh, salvation or getting out of the bind. And here and there, Kant seems to imply, well, something other than us seems to be necessary to get us out of this bind. But, in fact, then, Kant, having acknowledged that, simply says all that really matters for us is that we work to reform ourselves, dragging the whole issue back then again to what lies within the power or what seems to lie within the power of human uh, autonomous self-determination once again. Yeah. But, the, but, the, but the, the mystery of that inversion, if I can use that word, the, the perplexing inversion in the in, in incentive uh, the moral incentive itself, it seems to be a riddle wrapped in an enigma surrounded by a mystery. Well, you've raised a lot of points. I will address to some of them. Uh, first and foremost, the God's, God's job or God's function in the system. Well, I think that in the second chapter of his text about religion, Kant speaks about God, and he does not think, he does, he does not think and he says explicitly, that we can bring, we can make it re actual, the, we can make the high good actual. So it's more or less, do your best and hope that God will do the rest, I would say. So there is a place, a systematic place for God, I think. It will be problematic. Yes, I mean, I read that text as a much more tricky text. I don't take, I, I, I distrust Kant's rhetoric, because Kant is doing certain things and using certain rhetorics, but I think he's uh, hiding the fact that he is, as much as he can, superannuating God. He wants to put God on ice as much as possible in that text. Well, God has a moral function in his system. Yeah, that is correct. But I think that this, this function is irreducible. I mean, it, is, and it has a lot to do with the possibility of acting yeah. morally. Because if I can act morally, if it's possible, then the highest good is possible. But it's possible only if we assume God. This is why God is trapped, so to say, in the, yeah. in the ethical uh, terrain to begin with. But he's not, it is not to be, it's, it's I, I be read, I read Kant God. much more suspiciously than you. Um, I think if Kant could have gotten rid of God, he'd have gotten rid of God. But he couldn't and brought him in in a certain very equivocal way so, that says yes and no. Mm. We read him differently. <laughs> I read it according to the moral. The source of validity can't be God because the source of validity is formal. 
is yeah. something to do with contradiction. It, can't be all, it cannot be the, the historical source of the categorical imperative because we, it's our loss, okay? This is the yeah. definition of autonomy. But he's at the end of the process and not at the beginning. So God will be, yeah. I would say. But he is important because if he won't be at the end of the process, the highest good won't be possible. If the highest good won't be possible, we cannot accept the moral law as a sufficient incentive of the will, and then we cannot be moral. So yeah. we have to assume freedom, and then we, are, then we must receive God as well. If we are not assuming freedom, then, then you are right. But, but Kant, I think, wants to assume and, and accept freedom. So it's an inevitable consequence, I would say, of his ethical theory, but I guess let us agree to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have uh, in this uh, lecture last question by Professor Herd, Michael. Yeah, just, um, yeah, I just want to comment then in a way um, your um, paper, Amit's paper, has uh, verified uh, Gabi's one because uh, precisely uh, what Nazism did was to pose an alternative law. Uh, uh, as a radical source of radical evil, which Kant doesn't recognize, as you say. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I may contextualize the relationship between the two, and Gabi was trying to refer to our ongoing controversy about it, I think this, this point has, uh, his, has a very important historical significance, namely within German society that has always had this deep respect to the law, uh, yeah, at the end of the 18th century, there couldn't be any other respect to uh, a law which, or to any law which is not moral. What happens, and the radical element in Nazism is precisely posing an alternative law to which the German nation had uh, respect and supported, even if they didn't agree with it in 1933. So, in this respect, I think that the uh, contextualization of the problem is highly important and if I may just say at the end, I think also Gabi's own um, exposition, uh, the way you put the concept of radical evil in, uh, in our perception is, has also to be contextualized. I mean it's a result of 50 years of discussion after the Holocaust. Yeah, well, to say something? I don't want to Eichmann used Kant as an excuse, by the way, so he did this. But I think that according to Kant, according to Kant uh, and Gavi would agree, I think, you, the Nazi cannot offer an, a universal law because it would be contradictory. So the Nazis offered a different law, but not a uni universal law. And it would be the difference. So they cannot generalize it, as Gavi said. And this is why... Because they're not devilish, they're only radically. They're only radical, exactly. That's right, for Kant. Hitler was not the devil, he was not the teufel, he was just... That's, that's the hard problem, is to think that the Nazis were human beings, and therefore they could only be radically evil and not devilish. Okay, okay thank you very much to Amit Kravitz. It was really fine presentation. <laughs> and now I have the pleasure to introduce our guest from Haifa. Uh, Dr. Annabel Herzog. She is uh, the head of the department for what's called in Hebrew Mimshal Verayon Medini, which would be government and political theory. Idea. Okay. theory. And she has worked uh, extensively on especially Levinas and Hannah Arendt, and she will take our discussion on radical evil one step further with her talk on the banality of evil versus the radicality of the good. Thank you very much. It's been a long and very, very interesting day, and we're all tired. And my talk is the last one, so here is the good news. My talk is the last one. <laughs> and after me, it's dinner, so let's go. I would like to thank Gabi and Christophe and Mera for hosting and organizing this conference and inviting me. And so the topic of the banality of evil, namely Hannah Arendt's famous phrase in her book on the Eichmann's trial, Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil, may seem a bit banal. We've heard about it many times. We've read many arguments against it and in its defense. It will be a real challenge for me to try to say something new or interesting about it. So I'm here 
to talk about Hannah Arendt's conception of evil. I will explain what she meant by banality of evil in the context of her political philosophy and of her general understanding of human nature. To sum up my argument at the outset, I will say that Arendt didn't, be didn't believe in original sin, but she believed in miracles. According to her, evil can be extreme, it hurts and destroys, it must be punished, but it has no essence, for it isn't connected to sin. As she said, it has no depth. In, its, in itself, it consists, it consists of nothing important, nothing of real interest, although its co consequences are certainly important. Evil, evil, evil is frustrating for thinking and for philosophy, which find only superficiality when they try to understand it. The good, however, is radical, meaning etymologically that it has a root, an essence, but a miraculous essence. The, the, the good for Arendt is an unexpected miracle which stimulates thinking and philosophy. Arendt's book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, was published in 1963 after she covered the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem in 1961 for the New Yorker. In the book, we find the phrase banality of evil twice only. Once in the subtitle of the book, which is called Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil, and the second time at the end of the last chapter of the book, last chapter before its epilogue and its later added postscript, the phrase end, ends the chapter and it goes like this, quote, Adolf Eichmann went to the gallows with great dignity. He was in complete command of himself, nay, he was more. He was completely, completely himself. Nothing could have demonstrated this more convincingly than the grotesque silliness of his last words. He began by stating emphatically that he was no Christian and did not believe in life after death. He then, pro he then proceeded. After a short while, gentlemen, we shall all meet again. Such is the fate of all men. Long live Germany, long live Argentina, long, long live Austria. I shall not forget them. In the fate of death, he had found the cliché used in funeral oratory. Under the gallows, his memory played him the last trick. He was elated, elated and he forgot that this was in his own funeral. It was as though, in, the, in those last minutes, he was summing up the lesson that his, this long course in human wickedness has, had taught us, the lesson of the fearsome word and thought defying banality of evil. End of quote. The Eichmann book in general, and the expression the banality of evil in particular, generated a big controversy. Many of Aaron's friends stopped all contacts with her because of the book. I won't focus on the controversy related to the book in general, but only on, on that part of the controversy that is related to the banality of evil. The most immediate and frequent understanding of the phrase was that banality meant that Eichmann's evil was not that big. Banal would here mean not important. According to that interpretation, Arendt's argument was that Eichmann didn't do so many evil things, or that what he did was not so bad, or that it was bad but not in an unprecedented and unforgivable manner. This obviously led to much anger against her. However, this is a total misunderstanding of what Arendt meant. Arendt explicitly said that what Eichmann did was unprecedented, that even a very small part of his deeds was enough to incriminate incriminate him, and that she was strongly in favor of hanging him. Buber or Jaspers were against hanging him, but Arendt was in favor of hanging, hanging him. The second widespread understanding of the banality of evil consists of what I will call the little Eichmann argument. Banal here means that we all have a little Eichmann within us, namely that under cer certain conditions, all humankind would act, would act like Eichmann. Well, this is also a misunderstanding of what Arendt meant. Arendt clearly said so in a 1972 interview when replying to the scholar Christian Bay, quote, First of all, you like my book Eichmann in Jerusalem. And you said that I said there, and you said, and you say that I said there is an Eichmann in each one of us. Oh no, there is none in you and none in me. This doesn't mean that there are not quite a number of Eichmanns but they look quite different. I always hated this notion of Eichmann in each one of us. This is simply not true. This, was, this would be as untrue as the opposite, that Eichmann, Eichmann is in nobody." End of quote. 
The little Eichmann argument has two main flaws. First, it generalizes generalizes a case, the Eichmann case, that for Iran should not be generalized. As we will see, as we will see in a few minutes, one of the, few, of the main points of her theory of totalitarian regimes and of her understanding of the genocide of the Jews is that most people act in the same way, but not all people. Secondly, and as a corollary of the first point, it removes Eichmann's responsibility and the possibility of judging him. If each of if each one of us would have acted like Eichmann, Eichmann cannot be blamed for his acts. He simply did what everyone would have done. For Arendt, this idea is untrue and ridiculous. In her opinion, Eichmann was to be blamed for his acts, was individually responsible for them, and was guilty. This, this misunderstanding of Arendt's phrase is based on too quick an understanding of the psychological and historical theories of obedience to orders, usually formulated at the time of the Eichmann tr trial, in particular Milgram, Milgram's experiment, which shows that in certain conditions, most people indeed obey orders, even terrible orders. Milgram, however, didn't show that all people obey all orders and didn't conclude from his experiment that people are not responsible for, the, for their acts. Moreover, Milgram's experiment is useful to understand the psychological background to, of obedience to authority, but it doesn't help judging criminals. The last understanding of the banality of evil comes from what I would call the theory of bureaucratic evil. According to this conception, in totalitarian regimes, the evil perpetrators are cogs in a big machine. It means two things. First, they are never directly in contact with their, victims, with their victims. And second, their work is a very small part of a general scheme that they don't completely understand and that they, and that they don't control. Banal here means fragmented and alienated. Bureaucratic evil is of a new kind which must be understood together with totalitarianism itself. Well, this is closer to what Arendt meant, but only from a particular perspective. As I will show, for Arendt, evil is, is indeed part of a general package of totalitarianism, and in totalitarianism there is alienation and fragmentation. However, this doesn't mean that in totalitarianism people are not responsible for their be behavior. So, what did Arendt mean by her expression of the banality of evil? What she meant must be understood within the general framework mentioned at the beginning of my talk. There is no original sin. There is no original sin means that evil is not an ineluctable part of the human nature. Evil is a behavior that has no a priori essence. It's the consequence of, it's a consequence of psychological, social, political conditions. Arendt is here strongly influenced by existential, existentialism. For her, evil has no a priori features, no predefined substance. In addition, there is nothing essentially evil in the German nature, i.e. German culture. In particular, there is nothing essentially antisemitic in German culture. Goldhagen thinks differently. By the way, his book, Willing Ex Executioner, was written against Christopher Browning's book, Ord Ordinary Men, but also and more deeply against Arendt's view on the Holocaust. Arendt never said that Germans were not anti-Semitic at the time of Hitlerism or, or even before. She said that anti-Semitism was not essential to German culture, and more, that a person doesn't need to be furiously anti-Semitic to murder thousands or millions of Jews. In her book, she insists again and again on the fact that Eichmann was not furiously anti-Semitic. Anti she never said that he was not anti-Semitic. However, she emphasized that fanatic anti-Semitism of the kind of the Hungarian leader Laszlo André or Julius Streicher was not necessary to become a mass murderer. Thus, says Arendt, if we put aside the perpetrators who were psych psychiatrically de deviant, they were indeed pathological sadists among the murderers, and whom, therefore, we cannot consider as evil, but more as sick people. We are left with a group of people who were psychologically normal. Eichmann himself was considered normal by the Israeli psychologists and psychiatrists, and were not necessarily fanatically anti-Semitic, yet were able to kill millions of Jews. Their evil was huge and unprecedented 
But it was not a defined satanic thing. It was the result of many processes into which people were thrown by choice, but not always with the clearly formulated intention to do evil. This is what she meant when she said that they were ba ba banal, or that evil can be extreme but has no depth. But what does it mean to do extreme evil without clear intention to do evil? Are people like little children who do not always fully understand the meaning and implications of their acts? The foundation of Arendt's thought here is here again profoundly existentialist. In certain conditions, people lose the ability to understand fully what they are doing. It's a question of condition or situation and not of nature or substance, and hence, the people who, in the conditions that I will describe in a minute, lose the ability to understand fully the meaning and implications of their acts, could in fact put themselves in other conditions. Situations or conditions are chosen, and this is why people are responsible. They are responsible not only for their acts, but also for the conditions in which they put themselves, even if these conditions make them lose the ability to fully understand their acts. To make an analogy that Aaron didn't make, but that corresponds at least partly to what she meant, if you drive while, while drunk and run over a pedestrian and are brought to court, you can possibly argue that your only action was to drive your car and that you were passively led to the accident with no possibility to resist. However, it is then easy to answer that indeed, under the influence, you had no way to control your car. But you could have and should have avoided driving while drunk. Same thing about evil. Certain conditions make people become evil perpetrators. However, they could avoid these conditions. Thus. What are the conditions that lead to extreme but banal evil? The answer to that question is spread th throughout the whole of Aaron's work, starting from her understanding of totalitarian regimes in the origins of totalitarianism and ending in the phenomenological descriptions of the life of the mind. Similar to what I already described, these analyse, this analyses have an existentialist flavor. For Arendt, banal, banal evil emerges when the basic component of collective life, polit political responsibility, is destroyed. What's political responsibility? Political responsibility is the connection between belonging to a collective group and doing something new, which in Arendt's terms is called acting. Political responsibility is the concrete actualization of membership or fellowship. I am politically responsible when my actions stand for others, namely when accepting my link to a particular community and its traditions, my acts are the continuation of the fate of the members of that community. However, acting means doing something new, and hence I am responsible only when I transform the given that I also accept. In other words, I'm responsible when, through my initiative, I challenge my specific community and its traditions. Political responsibility, so defined, is the main component of political life. For Arendt, the critical simultaneity of belonging and acting, that is, political responsibility, is manifested in the making of opinions. Indeed, for her, and she's here very strongly influenced by phenomenology, Individual opinions are formed in relation to others. Quote, no one is capable of forming his own opinion without the benefit of a multitude of opinions held by others. End of quote. Therefore, opinions are possible only for those who, make, who take others into account. Quote, I form an opinion by considering a given issue from different viewpoints, by making present to my mind the standpoints of, of those who are absent. That is, I represent them. It's a question of being and thinking in my own identity where actually I am not. The more people's standpoints I have present in my mind while, while I am pondering a given issue, and the better I can imagine how I would feel and think if I were in their place, the stronger will be my capacity for representative thinking and the more valid my final conclusions, my opinion. End of quote. According to Arendt, the specificity of totalitarian regimes is to destroy the very possibility of opinions forming and by this of political life and political responsibility. Totalitarian regimes destroy opinions with the help of terror and ideology. 
which destroys all other cognitive processes. Ideology is the triumph of an idea that becomes the only lens th through which reality is seen. It re replaces all thoughts, theories, explanations, beliefs, and even feelings. Because of his ideology that was manifest at the trial in his incessant use of cliché, Eichmann never had an opinion. He never attem attempted to think in his own identity where actually he was not. He never thought from anybody else's standpoint. He never fu fully realized that his deeds affected other people. Quote, the longer one listened to him, the more obvious it became that his inability to speak was closely connected with an inability to think, namely to think from the standpoint of somebody else. No communication was possible with him, not because he lied, but because he was surrounded by the most reliable of all safeguards against the words and the presence of others, and hence against reality as such. End of quote. Eichmann's inability to think must be here understood in a strong way. Of course he was normal and could formulate normal thoughts. Of course he formerly knew that he was sending millions of people to death. But he never fully realized that these people were people. Or more exactly, he put himself or agreed to be put in the ideological conditions that preventing him from fully realizing that the millions he was send sending to death were people. This is what Arendt called the banality of evil. The phenomenon was a novelty and the sign of the complete destruction of the political. It revealed the annihilation of representative thinking, that is, of political opinion <coughs> sorry, and political responsibility. Eichmann's crime was expressed at the trial in his inability to remember the suffering that he has instigated, in his incapacity to admit that he provoked a killing, namely in his absolute obliviousness of his victim's standpoint. His crime was not only mass murder, other people did the actual murder, but his obliviousness of the fact that he was dealing with people and with, li with living people. In that context, I would like now to try to formulate an additional interpretation of banality, which Arendt never mentioned, which, but which, I think, best emphasizes her intention. Etymologically, banality was first connected to feudal law. In feudal times, public spaces were divided into those who could be freely, freely used and administrated by the people, the commons, and those for which people had to pay taxes, called banality, banality. French. For instance, mills and ovens belong to feudal lords but could be used by the people after mandatory payment of a tax, the banality. To speak now in Aran terms, one could say that totalitarian regimes annihilated all the commons of political life, namely all free interaction, interaction, initiative, deliberation and action between people. What was left, however, was a public obligation, a public activity that was mandatory to all, a banality, and it was evil. Evil was a mandatory, a mandatory tax, a banality. The best known episode of the Eichmann in Jerusalem controversy was an exchange of letters between Arendt and Gershom Scholem, after which the two friends ceased all contacts. In her answer to, in her answer to Scholem's critical letter about the book, Arendt wrote, quote, in conclusion, let me come to the only matter where you have not misunderstood me, and where indeed I am glad that you raised the point. You are quite right. I change my mind and do no longer speak of radical evil. It is indeed my opinion now that evil is never radical, that it is only extreme, and that it possesses neither depth nor any demonic di dimension. It can overgrow and lay waste the whole world precisely because it spreads like a fungus on the surface. It's, it is thought-defying, as I said, because thought tries to reach some depth, to go to the roots, and the moment it concerns itself with evil, it is frustrated because there is nothing. That is its banality. Only the good has depth and can be radical. Only the good has depth, namely roots, and can therefore be radical. But what does that mean? What kind of roots of depth does the good have? Arendt never explained this point. In the text written at the time of the Eichmann book or later, we find no develop development of this thesis. In fact, she never wrote anything on the good per se. 
But we must, we must remember that she was a political thinker and an existen existentialist philosopher influenced by Aristotle. In other words, for her, the moral good and the political good were one, or at least were very close to each other. And therefore, instead of describing the good in an essentialist way, she gave concrete examples of political responsibility. In Eichmann in Jerusalem, she emphasized the story of Anton Schmidt, a German officer who helped Jews by sabotaging police orders and who was executed for his acts. What was particularly important to Arendt in that story was not that someone helped the Jews, but that it was a German who did so. The value of Schmidt's initiative lies in the fact that he was a German. She writes, quote, politically speaking, the lesson of Schmidt's story is that under conditions of terror, most people will, co will comply, but some people will not, end of quote. Under Hitler's regime, all Germans were acting in a certain way, and being German had a certain meaning. However, by his actions, Schmidt transformed that meaning. By taking the initiative of helping Jews, it changed the very meaning of being a German, the meaning of his fellowship. He was a German who saved Jews. Therefore, they were Germans who saved Jews. Some people will not comply, Aaron says. In other words, some people will take upon themselves the responsibility to act and change the human world, the actual situation and the meaning of membership itself. Aaron's claim is extreme. Political responsibility, according to her, can go as far as the sacrifice of one's own life. In a text called Organized Guilt and Universal Responsibility, she wrote, the only way in, way, the, the only way in which we can identify an anti-Nazi is when the Nazis have hanged him. There is no other reliable token. But how should we understand Arendt's assertion that most people will, will comply, but some people will not? How to understand the fact that some people succeed in freeing themselves from ideological brainwash and refuse the conformism generated by terror? terror? How to make sense of these, exceptions to, of these exceptions to the rule? Arendt never looked into private life or education or psychological attributes to explain the difference between Eichmann and Anton Schmidt. She didn't think this data relevant. What was important to her was only this man's political choices. Eichmann accepted destroying the world while Schmidt tried to save it. She never explained the reason for this difference. However, in her most important book, The Human Condition, she wrote, quote, action is, in fact, the only miracle working faculty of man, end of quote. Action or political responsibility is a miracle. The ability to act in the name of one's community and to change the given is a miracle. It happens even in the darkest time for no easily understandable reason. By contrast with evil which cannot be understood because it has no depth, the miracle that saves the world cannot be understood because it has too much depth. One cannot understand Anton Schmidt's self-sacrifice whose story appeared at the end Eichmann's trial like, quote, a sudden burst of light in the midst of impenetrable, unfathomable darkness. And therefore, concludes Arendt, and with her word, I will conclude my talk, quote, politically speaking, the lesson of stories like that of Schmidt is that under conditions of terror, most people will comply, but some people will not. Just as the lesson of the countries in which the final solution was proposed is that it could happen, in most places, but it didn't happen everywhere. Humanly speaking, no more is required and no more can reasonably be asked for this planet to remain a place fit for human habitation. Thank you. Well, that was a final, final to our session and we open discussion now for, with uh, Dr. Annabel Herzog, please. You're supposed to have a microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wondered uh, whether uh, Arendt construed the word radical as um, linked to roots, or have you done that? She did, uh, she did, but it's, it's the etymology. The etymology is not the meaning. So my question was 
Oh, no, she did it. She did it. Yes, she did. Yes, yes, yes. You want to talk? Amy. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you convinced me about the banality of evil and your interpretation of it, but I, I, I want to ask you a question and for you to ask Aaron the question about the, um, the depth of the good uh, or the, um, yeah, what, what did you say? Well, the um, radical good. And if, if, uh, if all this uh, analysis reposes on existential grounds, which depicts a situation in which a man is in a condition and then he has uh, freedom. And so the, the choice of the good is, is as much inessential as the choice for, the, for, for, for evil. And in, in, this, in this sense, well, there is something very charming about speaking about you know, the greatness of good and the banality of evil or the, 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 the fact that evil has no depth. But I would say, well, good has no depth either because we are in an inessential context. And then it's really just about freedom, the miracle of action, as you, as you say. It, you're totally right. That's why I use the word miracle. I used it in a very strong way. He or she believes in God. So there is, so there is no say, essence, but suddenly there is something with essence or with something divine. So there is divine. a hidden theology in Arendt. Yeah, of course. Wanna, okay. A strong one. Very strong one. I want to just say one quick thing to that, which is this idea comes up first in Boethius, the consolation of philosophy, where he says that people ask why is there evil in the world, and they should ask rather yeah. why is there good. They're good, yeah. yeah. Ar yeah. Arendt would totally agree with that. Good. I want to go along with this idea and also I uh, She uh, was too. So <laughs> much yeah. um, about the Milton experiment. Yeah. Now I had the occasion and the experience of participating really? in the, in the, at Columbia, and I'm also glad to say I was. Uh, I don't remember any of what there was. Two percent or one and a half percent who did not comply. I was one of them. But I want to give you the reason. It had nothing to do with food. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Well, the, the, you know, you had to press a button, which it, 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 electricity, shock treatment, shock treatment. And you know, I sit down, and I know there are other people whom I am going to ask questions, and they have to say, right, and well, they are the, I'm being tested, not they, but we thought that they are being tested, right? <laughs> now, what, what happened is, <laughs> What happened is that I knew that when you play a game, answers and so on, you know, uh, you sometimes play for pennies or, or, or matches or, or the little things. It's just, you know, we knew that they were paid and we were paid for, for the hour that we spent. So, and I, so I asked, what is this? So I'm being told that these are electric shock. You know, so I said, what well, you mean to say? When it goes up, it gets stronger. <clears throat> so the, the guy says, very nonchalant, he says yes. So it occurred to me that whoever runs this experiment must be an idiot. I thought he was an idiot because he could achieve the same by not, not such extreme things like electric shock, uh, shock. You know, I just thought it was a poor experiment because anybody who goes to these extremes is not a great thinker, you know, because we were paid. Mm -hmm. And so for the wrong reason, for, uh, what, what I'm trying to say, that you can be on the right side for the wrong reason. I don't think that you describe it, you just describe it, you just described wrong reasons. You described exactly what she said, you thought. They told you to do something and you had, yes, but you had, you had a thought instead of yeah, just... She didn't, have, she didn't care if the other guy got elected. Yeah, but it, 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 I, 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 I wasn't, no, I thought it was sort of an extreme measure, an unsensing measure. Of course, I know electric shock are undesirable. But I thought it was an extreme behavior where it wasn't called for. And so 
I didn't want to be take part in, in such a stupid experiment. Uh, but I also want to say, <clears throat> you didn't talk about fear. What it means to be in a situation where you are afraid to talk to your spouse or your neighbor or anybody, even if you disagree with what is taking place. I mean, the, the, the idea of, com uh, uh, I'm talking about taking part in, uh, or being silent, uh, not uh, going out in the street making a revolution. That the idea of, of uh, fear is, well, it's like that, that uh, uh, what is uh, alone in Berlin, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, fear is, 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 is a big thing. I said just... Self-preservation, not, not preservation of others, but self-preservation. I, I use the word terror. That's what she, she speaks a lot about terror. I didn't uh, develop this idea because it would take me too, too much time, but she very strongly described the two instruments of a totalitarian regime as ideology and terror, and terror means violence, and then you are scared and you, you comply because you are very... So she said that Anton Schmidt yeah. was scared and anyway did what he did, so, so he was a hero and, and he was the good. Here we have Professor Harvey. Uh, didn't realize I raised my hand, but... I didn't you? Oh, no, you don't have to. The, I mean, you don't... In the origin, in her first book, she used the word radical evil, and she took it from Kant, and she said it exactly in the sense that Gabi uh, uh, used it before, that it's something that is not, uh, um, uh, takes you out of humanity. Or, uh, so so she, 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 took, she took that, that phrase, and then she changed it. She totally changed it. And, and when she wrote Eichmann in Jerusalem, her banality of evil was against her first idea of Yes. She has a theology, not very developed, and she didn't write books about it, but in the human condition, which is her more, most political and you know, rational and everything book, she has these, these sentences about the miracle of living and the fact... Miracle, speaks of the miracle of repentance and refers to the Hebrew. Yes. I, I, I want to make a speculative comment Thank about you very much. Her. Remember, Zeb, that her uh, first her dissertation was called The Concept of Love. Yes, yeah, concept. Right, right. And in that book, she deals a great deal with the problem of whether, uh, how otherness relates to the human, and whether, in fact, it brings you out of the human and into the divine, or all the pitfalls of otherness. So she very much was conscious of this kind of frontier. That's why it's what the word Augustinian. Yeah. It's Augustinian, yeah. So, please, William and our... Will. We need, we need again the microphone. microphone. Just pass it over. Michael. Michael. 
thank you. For, thank you very much. Uh, I, th that, those remarks about her existentialism are very interesting. Um, I didn't realise she was so ex existentialist, actually. But um, I think uh, I think Eli made the comment about you know radical evil, radical good, existentialism. It seems to certainly in its Sartrean version, you know, essence or existence precedes essence. So we build up our essence through constructive activity and so on. But the starting point seems to be devoid of any determinacy that would define us this way or that way. There's no human nature and so on. So it'd be, it would be interesting for me to know more about her version of existentialism. But I was struck by your saying at the start she rejects original sin, and nobody has really talked about original sin here today. But then as you gave an account of her, it struck me, in fact, that she was reproducing a kind of version there, I mean, there are many different interpretations of original sin, uh, the notion of biological inheritance and often bound up with the sexual act itself and so on. But certainly one aspect of the sense of original sin is very much uh, uh, connected with the uh, sense of the solidarity of the human family as a whole. That is to say, again, in reading the fall of Adam and Eve, all human beings in some sense are... Uh, at, at one, that there's, a, there's a, an enigmatic solidarity of all human beings. Uh, and as you gave the account, it's through social constructions and social conventions and so on that we get the, the deviated in this direction and that direction. It's a kind of a, almost original sin in that social interpretation after the fact. Obviously not called original sin at all, but there is that interpretation, or at least there's a question raised by original sin that is there some enigmatic, deep-down solidarity of the human race? Hard to understand, but certainly, I would say, impossible to understand on purely existentialist uh, principles. I, I don't think there is anything enigmatic in, in, if you mean the evil side of the solidarity? Or N no, just the, the solidarity first. And if, 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 if one uh, falls somehow everyone is implicated. Not in the sense of a personal guilt, but that oh. the, the, the sins of one ripple out in manners that in very enigmatic ways affect others. No, I don't so we can't, we, I don't can't, think so. we can't abstract ourselves into a kind of autonomous individuality from that... Uh, Politically, you're right. We, for instance, she said that, I mean, if someone, if, if my country acts in an evil way, we are all responsible. I mean, I, she, she, she describes something quite similar to what you're saying, but in a political context, but not in a metaphysical context at all. There is absolutely nothing. I mean, the evil make, uh, uh, um, done by my neighbor doesn't affect me. I mean, has no connection to me, never. She, she, never, she never said anything like that. But the, the political evil uh, done by my country affects me, and and and, my, and affects my. I mean, and even affects the future leaders. Let's say that my country does evil actions now. In 100 years, the leaders, the new leaders, will be will take responsibility for what their country, uh, my country, did. Sorry. So so. Yeah, so she, she, she meant something like that, but it was not universal. It was not for the whole, the entire human ra uh, race. She never, she never meant uh, anything. Um, but, but on the other hand, I think that she would, she never said it, but on the good side of the story, there is something universal. This possibility of a miracle is universal. It doesn't happen all the time, and there's, there, there's a lot of evil in the world. But it can happen everywhere. Miracles can ha happen, all the t happen all the time. That's why we are still here and, and surviving and still um, helping each other sometimes. So there are two last questions. The first will be my own, and then it will be yours. Okay. Uh, I mean, the, uh, just when you talk about the miracle, in this political uh, context, uh, one is somehow uh, in one could. Has she read Carl Schmidt? Because I mean, if I ta if I would take up now the political theology, and I'm you know that's that's my name more or less, then um, we, I have the following structure: the sovereign action is one that is suspending the law. 
And this very suspension of the law is supposed to be the hard core of our political life, according to Schmidt. But it leads, of course, to a state which is potentially a tyranny. That's the idea of political theology. And when you read the next chapter, that is the, actually the third, then there is supposed to be an analogy between this sovereignty and the theological miracle. But when Schmidt is doing this game, he's actually uh, introducing a kind of hidden secularization theory. He says, well, sovereignty is what's left from the miracle, but still it's the analogy to the miracle. So one could claim that what Arendt is actually doing here is picking that frame up. It's a sovereign action in a situation like this Anton Schmidt is being living and to, to do a sovereign thing and a good thing. And in that sense, this is then another kind of miracle from the other side. So it really sounds like a reverse of the Schmittian theory of the political theology and it fits perfectly because it is a counteraction to that kind of uh, sovereign theory. So um, I guess she has read that. Okay, so I, I must confess that I forgot. And it's, I, I, I knew, I mean, she d never quote him in text, but maybe he's in footnotes, and I can't remember. And the, f the reason why I can't remember is that very often we study or we read Arendt with Schmidt. Yeah. So I have the feeling that indeed she read him or she connected that's to him. That's what Agamben is but doing. Yes, yeah. that's what Agam Agamben is doing. So Agamben read, read, reads them together. So it sounds logical that she read him or even, uh, even uh, uh, related to him, but I, can't, I, I, I don't know. remember. I mean, it's beyond, it's, a, it's the similarity of yeah. the structure which is striking. So our last question, please. Annabelle, thank you very much. I really enjoyed that. Um, I am confused um, to think about um, Hannah Arendt as somebody who, um, like many others of her generation, lived through um, such a chaos, such an abyss of all of the distinctions between good and evil and all of the complications you described that, that came with that, such as working out you know, the ethical state of mind of somebody who either did participate or refused orders and that kind of thing. Um, and I'm just wondering, in light of that, um, why she or maybe others um, would not have been attracted to a more de-essentialized type of reality or ontology where um, either mystic or postmodern um, ontologies where... Um, reality is de-essentialized, where the polarities of good and evil are, are brought down, would not have allowed a sort of political she or ethical wrote, theory from a new... She wrote very clearly that she belonged to these philosophers that were to de-ontologized reality. She wrote that. She was a Heidegger student. And very clearly, it's her school of thought, and she was very, uh, she worked in that direction. Now, she was not, I mean, I know what you're studying and doing, so I can tell you, she was not a postmodern, uh, because there was nothing like postmodernism at that time, and even if there was, uh, she, she wouldn't have been a postmodern. There was a lot of Nietzscheanism around. She was, she was totally Nietzsche. I mean, she read lots of Nietzsche, and she, she, she quote, quoted Nietzsche. Nietzsche everywhere, but she was she was a phenomenologist, so pre so pre it's it's still essentialist, and trying with following Heidegger to work in toward a certain direction of working the idea of ontology and deontologizing reality, but she chose to do it in in the political sphere, which changes everything. I mean, her way to describe politics is totally without essence. People act, and you, you, can, you, can, you have to look at their action. You, there is nothing before action, absolutely nothing. There is no human nature. There's a, there's a political reality, but there's no human, absolutely no human nature in Arendt. And, you, and she says, says it in the, most, in the clearest way. So. Okay, so we end with another aporia. The first one we start, stop with whether it's God or evil. Now we don't know whether it's a good or a or a bad nature, but that was a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.